Hi, my name is Anil Mittal, and I am currently in a three-year-long legal battle with the largest builder in the United States of America. I'm going to hold right there. Yeah. <laughs> so my wife and I purchased this house behind me from Ryland Homes. Uh, Ryland Homes eventually got sold. They got sold to Cal Atlantic Homes, who then got bought by the largest builder in the U.S. Um, essentially, the superintendent that was building our house was simultaneously building 21 other houses at the same time. So obviously, he didn't have the ability to really keep an eye on what was going on in our house. And with the construction boom that was happening in Houston, every subcontractor wants to get in, get out really quick, make their money and do the quickest job possible. Additionally, in the area of Texas that we live in, there are no inspections. There's no, there's no real permitting. There's no real inspections by a county organization or a city. It leaves really us in a, as, as consumers in a, in a bad place because the builder has all the power and the builder has, can really do whatever they want. So a really fast build of five months. You move into the home and within eight months, you are bedridden. Mm -hmm. And I had never been bedridden before. As soon as we moved into the house, we had problems with the house. We tried to have the builder fix those problems with the, with the house. They did not successfully fix those problems. Um, or actually on second thought, we thought they had successfully fixed the problems. We became more comfortable in the house. Humidity became a little bit more controlled, but then we thought that was the best we, that, that we could expect from a house like this. Between the time that we closed on the house and the time that we moved out of the house, I believe the HVAC subcontractor came back to do some sort of an adjustment or a repair about 45 to 60 times. We had planned a trip to Las Vegas and because of her health issues, we couldn't go. So I had decided to put in some recessed lights in our media room. And while I was in the attic uh, crawling around, I put my hand down in the insulation and it was soaking wet. And I looked up and I didn't see a, 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 a leak in the roof at all. Um, so I started digging around in the insulation to try to figure out if it was a pipe leaking or what, what was causing the, the issue. Yeah. And what I found is that it was an air conditioning duct going through a chase down to the first floor. And it was squeezed through a hole that was too small. It wasn't sealed. Um, and I guess there was condensation that was accumulating outside the duct causing that, uh, that to stay wet. And all the wood in that area was black. So we found it totally by accident. Because we had been through so many trials and tribulations with the builder, we decided let's hire a professional mold inspector. Yeah. Uh, we hired the inspector. She had come in, run a number of tests, and found very high mold concentrations throughout the house, not just in that area, but in many areas of the house. I mean, so bad that it was, she said it was as if the house had flooded and never been remediated. And we're like, the house hasn't even ever had a leak. A um, water leak. Ever. Nothing. Yeah. And this was after Harvey, mm -hmm. right? So like we're we're like, yeah, it didn't even have a leak during Harvey. And um, so we were just left like wondering like, how is this even possible, right? Like, how do you have such mold growth when there's never been a leak? For the most part, the dynamic was pretty clear. You've got uh, you've got a a lot of humidity outside. It makes its way in through the attic ventilation, uh, and then because of the nature of the HVAC system, the house is actually under negative pressure. So the air is actually being sucked out of the house. So of course, air being sucked out of a house, air has to come back in. And so you can follow it and you can see warm, moist air being drawn down into the interstitial cavities. Uh, where it's being exposed to a variety of different temperatures and dynamics because you've got duct work in there where you're gonna get condensation and drips. That's why you see the ceiling, the drips inside the ceiling. The ceiling cavity itself seems to be being used as an air conveyance system in certain areas, which is a big no-no, uh, but also not all that uncommon. And you can see the real manifestation of this, the, the most egregious uh, example of, of how bad the, uh, the mold in that house is, is really in the attic around the HVAC system itself. Um, HVAC systems, in my professional opinion, should never be located in an unconditioned space. Uh, you're heating and cooling your air, but putting the equipment in the hottest and coldest places. You're making it work twice as hard. And you're also introducing the, the variability that there's likely going to be a lot of air going in into the system uh, through, through leaky ductwork. The, the HVAC system in the, in the attic was completely in, covered in visible mold. The, the ductwork was so colonized that it looked like leopard skin. It really amazing. And everything was very dense. It was, it, it, it was a, a rat's nest of, of, of interwoven 
flex ducts that can never be cleaned, by the way. Uh, these are temporary at best, but they're being used as permanent. Uh, it's really, it's an unfortunate reality that that is, that is the de facto standard uh, in most construction these days. Putting air conditioning systems in unconditioned space and then also running these substandard flex ducts as a primary duct system. One thing we've learned watching these houses go up around us is that they go up very quickly. They all go up in the exact same manner and they go up without regard to the correct order in which you build a house. Um, they're trying to keep a schedule, they're trying to close on time, and you can, you can see when these houses are going up the type of problems they're going to have in 5 years, in 10 years, in 15 years. These are not houses like, like our parents had where they last for 50, 60, 70 years. You're lucky if you get 20 years out of one of these houses without a major rebuild. They're using materials that are not tolerant to mistakes, and there are a lot of mistakes made by a lot of subcontractors trying to do a lot of work in a little bit of time. If you're in a situation where you have to buy a production built house, um, if you can, visit the house every day. Um, educate yourself about basic building practices. Educate yourself on basic building science. Watch them like a hawk and then move out of that house in five years. Because building a house is a, is a complicated process. And if you don't have somebody there watching that process and, and stopping and halting work when it needs to be halted to fix an issue instead of just trying to meet a closing schedule, you will have problems. Yes, when I, when I first walked in the house, I asked Anil if, if he had kept the air conditioning on uh, because I noticed that it was, it was cool. Uh, and he said, yes, that was reaffirming because th the reality is, is that most people who leave a house because of these conditions will often turn off the utilities. Uh, they'll turn off the heat or the air conditioning. We call that vacation home syndrome. Uh, this happens a lot where you know everyone's gone to a, a place where they open up the door for their vacation and they smell that smell. And that's because someone decided they were gonna save a couple hundred bucks on the utility bill and then they cost themselves many, many thousands of dollars in mold remediation bills instead. Uh, and so, uh, so seeing that Anil was responsibly conditioning the air uh, was, was, uh, was reassuring, but even so, uh, and perhaps also, per perhaps because of all of that cooling, uh, we're seeing condensation form. But that's the way the building is supposed to be managed. Uh, and it's manifesting as uncontrolled mold growth. So if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in a climate like this, and it manifests as significant pervasive mold growth, something's really wrong. Uh, one of our dogs got very sick soon after we moved into the house. I started getting ocular migraines and vertigo. and. None of our doctors could really figure out what was going on yeah. with us, and we never suspected anything was going on systemically in the house. So prior to, to moving here, had you had health complications? Had your dogs had presented in health complications? Dogs had not, um, and we came here with two dogs, and then we got a third. I had some health issues, but those issues were kind of put on a shelf, and I developed other complications, and my pain management doctor was left scratching her head, like, what's going on? Pain medication stopped working. I had visible swelling, which I never had before. I developed just, I was bedridden within eight months of being in this house. And I had never been bedridden, even with any of the other health conditions that I had. Amazing. Yeah. Mold and its impact on health uh, is, is very individual. Uh, you can have five people living in a moldy environment and you'll have five different symptom profiles. Uh, that's just the way this is. It's very personal. Um, it's a lot like uh, a lot like allergies in the sense that, you know, peanuts, for example, are, are something that some people love and can have lots and lots of them. Uh, and, and there are other people that are, if they're exposed to even the dust from some, it's potentially lethal. Mold is not dissimilar in the way it impacts people. Not to say that anybody wants to have a lot of it in their house or should, but on the, on the extreme side where there's small amounts, uh, you know, it can have a very outsized impact on certain people. This is a case where uh, it's a significant infestation and you can see that it was significant well before it was visible the way it is now. You know, the, the kind of health profile that Nalima described uh, is not unusual when it comes to people experiencing serious mold symptoms. She already has a pre-existing condition, um, you know, but at that being said, what mold tends to do, at least it did this with me and has done this with many of the thousand customers that I've, that I've had over the years, is that it tends to bring out a latent set of, of uh, 
vulnerabilities or uh, it brings out uh, whatever you're already dealing with and brings it to the surface. So I'm not surprised to see the health effects here. Uh, it's disheartening, of course, but you know, the reality is, is that even in a house where you might have five people living in, in, in a moldy environment and there's five different symptom profiles, one person may be complaining most vociferously, but when you get rid of the mold, suddenly the other four people start saying that they're sleeping better. They're not having so many emo emotional, so much emotional dysregulation. Suddenly, you know, their, their skin is clearer. Uh, they're, they're, they're all of a sudden they're, they're recognizing that their baseline symptoms were actually unhealthy. Uh, and that absent that chronic exposure, once again, they begin to, to reset and normalize. Our largest dog, Diesel, started just draining from his nose at all times, sneezing, weird color mucus was coming out of him. When we took him into the ER, uh, not the ER, but the vet, we were referred to, an, to a specialist who did a number of, of tests, blood tests, swabs, and also did an MRI and found that he had a fungal infection in his sinuses. And they attributed it to the grass? They said the only thing they could think of is that he snorted something up in the grass. And it, it caused changes in his sinuses, structural changes. It's an autoimmune, it's called rhinitis, but it's an autoimmune. It caused an autoimmune reaction. Yeah, and so it forever changes the structure inside the sinuses. Okay. And what we had learned later is that the room that we had designated as the dog's bedroom actually had one of the highest mold counts in the entire house. And that room was actually my office for the first two years, I believe, that we were in the house. Right. And then we designated it for the dogs. So I had been in that house, in that room first, and I probably spent like five, six hours a day there, but they spent quite a bit of time there, like all night long. Mm -hmm. I would argue that most doctors think they're scientists. Uh, uh, they're aspiring scientists. Uh, they, they're halfway there. Um, but they, in many cases, are unqualified to deal with, um, with what I call house calls. Uh, in essence, uh, the, the last mile of actual treatment and care uh, doesn't occur in the clinic, it doesn't occur in, in an office building, it occurs in the home. And uh, the, the exposures that we have in our homes and workplaces are often considered secondary or tertiary to other things. Um, and so it's a blind spot, I think, unfortunately, for, for many physicians uh, that want to have a quick and easy, you know, this causes this. And my experience with mold and indoor air quality is that it's really that simple. Going through this process with the attorneys and with the builder, one thing I've learned is there is no winning. Nobody wins at the end of this. Everything's a compromise. The really sad part of this situation is that at the end of the day, the builder is not liable for any of this. It's their subcontractors that are liable. It's the subcontractors and the subcontractors insurance companies that are going to end up paying the bill at the end of the day. So the builder gets off scot-free and continues to, to uh, you know, to do these same kind of building practices for other people. Uh, walking right up to the house, you could tell that there were problems or you can tell that there are problems. Um, initially, you can see where the gutters are, are not performing well, where water is actually running against the facade of the house. It's always a red flag for us. Uh, you see just the roof design in general is not actually um, efficiently shedding water. And that's a building's number one job is to, is to shed water and, and wind. Uh, and if it's not doing that well, you can be sure that there are other design flaws. At least that's been my experience. Um, and then as soon as you walk in, of course, we're wearing a respirator, so I wasn't able to pick up any of the, the typical sort of telltale scent associated with, uh, with mold growth. Uh, but right off the bat, you can see that around the hi-hats and any of the, the ceiling penetrations, for example, speakers, supply vents to the HVAC, there was, there, were, there was evidence of moisture and mold around many of them. Bathroom exhaust vents uh, that, that were just completely covered with, uh, with growth on and around them. But the, the pervasiveness of it, it was really remarkable. Um, and I've been in many, many homes and I've rarely seen one that was supposed to be inhabitable that's in this condition. Let's talk a little bit about a timetable because in a build often, you know, it can be raining in a build, water can get into the frame up of a home, which is one of the reasons why you, you kind of, as a home owner, want to be present at the build. Right. How long was your build? And from New Jersey, were you able to be present at any of the build? So the, they broke ground mid January. Of 2014. of 2014 and we closed june, june 27th, 27th of 2014. 2014. so inside of five months yeah. they 
they completed the construction of the house, start to finish. And we did come, he did come for some inspections and things like that throughout that time period. Um, and he, we had hired a, an independent inspector of our own. And, and when, when the house was quote unquote dried in, it was fairly dry in the house. It, the, we didn't, I don't remember seeing, and I, we have pictures of this as well. Don't remember seeing any streaked wood, any, any damp wood, any mold growth or anything like that. Yeah. Nobody left the bathtub running. No. no. There no. was no leak with the washer or dryer. Sure. No. No Never. leaks. No. no. Leaks. So within the first year of us moving in, though, we did find that in the laundry room, there was some mold. On the baseboard. Yeah. The wall opposing the washer and dryer. And we did let the builder know. So we did see that. And in hindsight, it's like, ah, well, okay. Yeah. Maybe that was a red flag. Yeah. Right. In hindsight. His explanation was, well, we power washed the garage, and at that point, some water got on the wall. And Maybe why wouldn't we believe it. that? Why? Right. I mean, we didn't know any better. Yeah. We really it's didn't. It's Houston. It's Texas. You're in a new land. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, when you buy a product, you're not necessarily the expert on that product, right? When we, as yeah. home buyers, we're not, I don't think there's a requirement that we have to be an expert on construction, an expert on building science, an expert on mold, an expert on any of these things. Yeah. We're looking to the builder as the professional as the expert on this. It's just like if you take your car to a mechanic for a repair, you're looking to them to be the expert and guide you and do the right thing by you to fix your car and make it safe for your family. 100%. And we, learned we expected otherwise. the same from a builder. Yeah, right. So after meeting Anil and Nalima and taking a walk through the home, none of it is very surprising in terms of the health issues she's dealing with. Uh, but in terms of the extreme nature of this, I would say it falls into the top 1%. And the reason for that is not so much that there's so much mold, but rather that there's so much that's not visible. Um, once we started pulling down speakers and going into the interstitial wall cavities, the, uh, the density of the mold and the, uh, the scope of the infestation was remarkable you see visible mold from, from the air flows coming out of electrical outlets on in, in interior rooms. It looks like a lot like the tip of the iceberg, right? That little tiny bit, that, that, that few percent that sits above the surface, that, this is a perfect example of exactly that. Mm -hmm. 